Wow, that was a just powerful conversation. Yeah, Whew. yeah. What was it? I mean, I I think what this thing I appreciate about her is I think I said at the intro it's been two decades. I don't think it's quite been two decades. About a decade and a yeah. half since she lost her daughter. But what I appreciate is she's still so still so real and raw about yep. her grief. Yep. Even, I mean, you heard it listeners, like even as we were talking, she was surprised by her own grief and how yep. at the surface it was. And, and yet here's a woman committed to trying to make a way forward experience yeah. all that God has for her and for her family while yep. they continue 14 years later. And I think, That's you right. know, until they meet Jesus face to face, continue yeah. to carry that pain and that grief. So I just really appreciated her wisdom and her, um, her commitment, I think, to right. even encouraging other people to take step forwards in their grief. Right. Well, you know, I think so. We, right before we got on to record these intros and outros, Aubrey, we um, I, I was doing a live coaching, and so we were taking questions yeah. from people. And one of the questions that was asked was, "How do you uh, see redemption in God's plan, even when there is a like there's a clear void or space?" Right, and she yeah. was referencing specifically the loss of a spouse, mm-hmm. and. I think more than almost any other kind of loss, a loss of a child mm-hmm. is going to make that reality very, I mean, it, it confronts that reality so much that because one of the responses that I gave this person, as I said, you've got to, you've got to shift your mindset to recognize that redemption does not mean replacement. There's mm. nothing that's going to replace this empty seat at the table, this void, yeah. right? Yeah. Redemption is in this in the midst of that void, there's a filling. So nothing's mm. gonna replace it, but God can fill. Mm. And then he That's as okay. Psalm twenty three uh tells us he our our cup overflows, right? And so yeah. those two things can be held in tension that nothing's going to f- like replace this void. And I think child loss presents that tension more than any other loss that I could right. you know, that I can imagine. Um and so anyways, I, I just, I appreciate uh, September's approach to all of this and the yeah. fact that she is, she, she is very real about these triggers that kind of come up and these, mm-hmm. this grief that surfaces even 14 mm-hmm. plus years ago, um, mm-hmm. you know, so, so that helps us who are in like, I'm seven years into grief and I get surprised yeah. by some of this stuff right. and I'm like, wait a minute, right. I thought I should be a little bit further along than this. I don't know what's happening right here. So speaking of Aubrey, I think that that we had a couple questions that were asked on our community platform that pertain to this. I I really want to bring those forward and and see what you think about it. Um, Someone asked, what do I do? How do I handle those triggers when they come years after the initial loss or trauma? And Mm -hmm. so this is a perfectly fit question for this. Mm, Yeah. What specifically, what do I do? (laughs) You know, like how do I This is like a practical question. What do I actually... Yeah, that's yeah. a rough one, Davy. And I, I think you, I would love to hear you speak to that, like years after Amanda's passing. Um, but I, I have a really good friend who's been through a lot of a lot of grief. Lost a child, uh, going through a very difficult illness right now. And um, when her grief hits her, I'm using her as an example because she's better at this than I am. I tend as a four in the Enneagram, like not to be great at compartmentalizing my grief. Mm. She's actually really good at like um, when, when she's triggered to kind of evaluate Am I in a safe space right now where I can feel all the things that I want to feel and my my body needs me to feel right, right now, right? right. Um, maybe she's got other kids, maybe my kids are around and I don't need to hide my grief from them, but I need to like, have like a, a good old ugly cry. And I don't necessarily want to put that on my kids. I want to do that privately. So she's very good at kind of noting, I can tell my body needs to grieve this, Mm. this meal that I'm having, the scent of it has triggered my pain and my grief for some reason, because it reminded me of a memory Mm. who I'm going to note it, but then she'll kind of go, I'm going to mentally put it on like an, like a shelf in my brain or in my soul or whatever. But she is very intentional about later that night, later that week, whenever finding like almost an appointment with her grief. Like, um, 
I'm going to spend an hour in the shower, ugly crying or by myself in the car or in my bedroom, whatever it is. And saying, I will make an appointment with my grief because my body is inviting me to do that. God is inviting me to do that. But then after that appointment's done, I'm going to, I'm going to put it back up there and I'm going to go back and be the mom, the career woman, the the professional I need to be. And that has always struck me as I could see how some people would think that's unhealthy, but that has always struck me actually is really healthy very and so. very wise because she's yep. not ignoring. Like she's right. like, no, 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 there, there's something in me that's being triggered and I need to honor that. Like, yeah. like my pain is, is needing some attention. My heart is needing some attention. My loss is needing some attention. And I want to, I want to serve my grief and my pain really well, but I just can't do it right now. Mm. I got three little kids running around or I have a deadline or I have. So I'm going to do it later on this week when I can give it the proper due. And I, I think that is a very practical, very practical piece of advice. Easier said than done. But I do think with practice that can happen. And, and again, like we've talked about grief is a, it's a lifelong journey. So it's not like you have to you don't have to do it all today. Like right. it's a muscle you you can build. What? Tell yeah. me about your experience of this, Davey. Well, you brought up a couple of great points, right? This whole grief thing is a muscle that we can build. In yeah. fact, I think that's an important paradigm shift. Um, this doesn't get easier. Mm. I think people will. Well, this just this gets easier. No, you get stronger. Oh, that's good. Yeah. Yeah. So this is a weight. This is something that's heavy. This is this is tough to carry. And mm-hmm. early on in your grief, you don't have the grief muscles or the tools to know how to carry it. And so you're mm-hmm. learning those, which is why it's imperative that you don't try to numb or anesthetize. I think that's I think September actually talked about that. We don't try to like, you know, cope or manage that pain, right. but we actually allow those triggers to be invitations from God to step into deeper healing. Yeah. And so when we accept that invitation and we go there with God, mm-hmm. then our muscles get built, our grief muscles get built. Yeah. So now five years later, seven years later for me, right? Mm-hmm. I, I was, you know, I had my sunglasses on, we were sitting at the beach this, you know, at the time of recording this, it was this past weekend while we're spending time with Amanda's family it was a big weekend because it's Weston's birthday, Amanda's birthday, and our wedding anniversary all within Davey. a matter of four days. That's so we're sitting so at the much. beach. We were very intentional about like, let's go spend time with her family with, you know, and, mm-hmm. and let's do some camping and let's sit around. And let's talk about Amanda. Let's, rem- let's share memories. You know, I kept my sunglasses mm-hmm. on the entire time because I'm just oh. tears welling, you know, <laughs> I bet you did. And mm. it was so meaningful and so special. And I couldn't like, I couldn't mm. quite put language to it. The fact that I have my wife. Now, Christy sitting right next right. to me asking questions about her and just it's like pretty amazing. What a beautiful and yet also just heart wrenching thing all at the same time. Yeah. Yeah. And so you're living in that tension, right? And so it it's not like it was easier than early on in my grief journey being at the Thanksgiving table with Amanda's family. Mm, We're just yeah. stronger. Mm, We've yeah, leaned into good. those triggers. We've leaned into those yeah. invitations and we've yeah. worked through those. And now our grief muscles are they're they're able to carry and hold the weight mm. of what we're experiencing right there. Mm. And so I think that's really important to understand. And so, yeah. so even then, you know, I, I'd say, first of all, like right now, if you're fresh, like lean into those triggers, that way your totally. grief muscles can grow. Don't put that yeah. off. Right. You know? right. Don't keep it at bay. And then later, as you do get surprised still by some of those situations, mm-hmm. I, I love that piece of advice that you brought forward from your friend. I mean, Mm -hmm. Oh my goodness, what a great practice and exercise. Yeah. And, um, I think it just is helpful to know, Hey, listen, you are going to be surprised sometimes. So don't be surprised that this will surprise you. Right. That's what I was thinking. I think any, any of that kind of language of like, Oh, I, I thought I would be here by now. I thought it would be further. I should be like, just erase that from your vocabulary. That's yeah. if that's worldly kind of grief advice that says time heals all wounds. Like that's not mm-hmm. true. Mm-hmm. Right. And so I just I don't even want you to put that extra guilt on yourself if you're yeah. carrying that. Like like Davy said, I mean, grief is heavy, and I mm-hmm. I do think it's a muscle that you build over time. I I've heard lots of grieving people say it. It never gets easier, but I learn how to carry it. And I think ultimately you're learning how to let God carry it with you. That's exactly right. That's it. Yeah. Yep. You're learning how to turn it over to the Lord. You're learning how to. And so right now, if your year is removed and you're seeing, and you don't want to be overwhelmed by this, you don't want to Mm -hmm. like, what do you do with these triggers? Well, the same thing you do early on, right? 
let those triggers, see those triggers as an invitation from the Lord, inviting you into deeper healing. He is gracious Mm -hmm. to, uh, for our healing to happen over a process over time. And so as we mm-hmm. begin to heal one part of our, this wounding, he's going to, something else is going to surface, right? Yep. And he's going to allow this just like to drip out over time. So he invites us into deeper healing. So ultimately he invites us to become more and more like the image of Jesus That's right. and into this place of shalom and wholeness. And so mm-hmm. that, that's what okay. I would say. That was such a great question. And I yep. think it was so appropriate for this conversation. We want to help you with that in any way that we possibly can. We have so many resources available for you at nothingiswasted.com. You can hire one of our certified coaches. You can join our community platform, which is free. You can join Community Plus. You can take the Pain to Purpose course. Um, and we have a ton of conversations, podcast episodes, resources, a lot of stuff that's that's free for you right there. In fact, Pretty soon you're going to be hearing about this new thing, curated pathways. I am so excited about this, by the way. I'm, I'm ecstatic about this because give the people a little, like a a little preview. Well, imagine you have somebody who undergoes some kind of specific loss in your life and you're going, well, where do I point them? This is where you point them. So I recently have a, had a friend, um, you know, well, let's think about it this way. You have a friend who's experienced sexual betrayal. Mm-hmm. Right, her husband has yes. cheated on her, or something like right. that. Right, right, uh, or or some kind of a, a sexual addiction, and this is just yep. surface. Where do you point them? Well, we'll have a curated pathway for sexual betrayal. Mm. All of our all of our content, all of our podcast episodes, all of our master classes, anything dealing with and pertaining to that subject. Here's the pathway, and so essentially, you so sign cool. up for it. And you receive all of that content already curated for you so that you don't have to go and search for it. It is just an easy pathway for you to walk. And so that's why we're calling it Curated Pathways. Be on the lookout for that. Uh, if you want to kind of find out more information, you can join our email list. All of that can happen right there at nothingiswasted.com. I'm super excited about this thing unfolding. Yeah, super excited about that. As always, we want to thank Sleeping at Last for providing the music for the Nothing Is Wasted podcast. You can stream his music wherever it is. Get your music. We also would love to engage with you on social media. You can find and follow us on Instagram at Nothing Is Wasted Ministries, at Davy Blackburn, and at Obsamp. 